the faces of the people I'll approach. I am going to go up to them holding out this $10 bill and say here, take this. My guess is that everyone will back off, look confused, insulted, or fearful, and want to get away from this nut fast. Communication 87 from their experience when someone approaches them, he is either out to ask for instructions or to panhandle, particularly the way I'm dressed, no coat or tie. I walked around, trying to give the $10 bill away. The reactions were all within the experiences of the people. About three of them, seeing the $10 bill, spoke first I'm sorry. I don't have any change. Others hurried past saying, I'm sorry, I don't have any money on me right now as though I had been trying to get money from them instead of trying to give them money. One young woman flared up, almost screaming I'm not that kind of a girl, and if you don't get away from here, I'll call a cop. Another woman in her 30s, snarled I don't, come that cheap. There was one man who stopped and said, what kind of a con game, is this? And then walked away. Most of the people responded with shock, confusion, and silence, and they quickened their pace and sort of walked around me. After approximately 14 people, I found myself back at the front entrance of the Biltmore Hotel, still holding my $10 bill. My four companions had then a clearer understanding of the concept that people react strictly on the basis of their own experience. For another example of the same principle, here is a Christian civilization where most people have gone to church and have mouthed various Christian doctrines, and yet this is really not part of their experience because they haven't lived it. Their church experience has been purely a ritualistic decoration. The New York Times some years ago reported the case of a man who converted to Catholicism at around the age of 40 and then, filled with the zeal of a convert, determined to emulate as far as possible the life of St. Francis Rules for Radicals, 88 of Assisi. He withdrew his life savings, about $2,300. He took this money out in $5 bills. Armed with his bundle of $5 bills, he went down to the poorest section of New York City, the Bowery this was, before the time of urban renewal, and every time a needy-looking man or woman passed by him he would step up and say please take this. Now, the difference between this situation and mine around the Biltmore Hotel is that the panhandlers on the Bowery would not find an offer of money or of a bowl of soup outside their experience. At any rate, our friend attempting to live a Christian life and emulate St. Francis of Assisi found that he could do so for only 40 minutes before being arrested by a Christian police officer, driven to Bellevue Hospital by a Christian ambulance doctor and pronounced non composmentis by a Christian psychiatrist. Christianity is beyond the experience of a Christian professing but not practicing population. In mass organization, you can't go outside of people's actual experience. I've been asked, for example, why I never talk to a Catholic priest or a Protestant minister or a rabbi, in terms of the Judeo-Christian ethic or the Ten Commandments or the Sermon on the Mount. I never talk in those terms. Instead I approach them, on the basis of their own self-interest, the welfare of their church, even its physical property. If I approached them in a moralistic way, it would be outside their experience, because Christianity and Judeo-Christianity are outside of the experience of organized religion. They would just listen to me, and very sympathetically tell me how noble I was. And the moment I walked out they'd call their secretaries in and say, if that screwball ever shows up again, tell him I'm out. Communication for persuasion, as in negotiation, is communication 89 more than entering the area of another person's experience. It is getting a fix on his main value or goal and holding your course on that target. You don't communicate with anyone purely on the rational facts or ethics of an issue. The episode between Moses and God, when the Jews had begun to worship, the golden calf asterisk is revealing. Moses did not try to communicate with God in terms of mercy or justice when God was angry and wanted to destroy the Jews. He moved in on a top value and outmaneuvered God. It is only when the other party is concerned or feels threatened that he will listen. In the arena of action, a threat or a crisis becomes almost a precondition to communication. A great organizer, like Moses, never loses his cool as a lesser man might have done when God said, Go, get asterisk and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Go get thee down. Thy people, which thou hast brought out of the land of Egypt hath sinned. 
They have quickly strayed from the way which thou didst shew them, and they have made to themselves a molten calf, and have adored it, and sacrificing victims to it, have said, These are thy gods, O Israel, that have brought thee out of the land of Egypt. And again the Lord said to Moses, See that this people is stiff-necked. Let me alone, that my wrath may be kindled against them, and that I may destroy them, and I will make of thee a great nation. But Moses besought the Lord his God, saying, Why, O Lord, is thy indignation enkindled against thy people, whom thou hast brought out of the land of Egypt, with great power, and with a mighty hand? Let not the Egyptians say, I beseech thee. He craftily brought them out that he might kill them in the mountains, and destroy them from the earth. Let thy anger cease, and be appeased upon the wickedness of thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swarest by thy own self, saying, I will multiply your seed, as the stars of heaven, and this whole land that I have spoken of I will give to your seed, and you shall possess it forever. And the Lord was appeased from doing the evil which he had spoken against his people. Exodus 32, 7 to 14, Day Rhymes Ed. Rules for Radicals 90 Thee Down. Thy people, whom th hast brought out of the land of Egypt, hath sinned. At that point, if Moses had dropped his cool in any way, one would have expected him to reply, Where do you get off with all that stuff about my people, whom slash brought out of the land of Egypt? I was just taking a walk through the desert, and who started that bush burning, and who told me to get over to Egypt, and who told me to get those people out of slavery, and who pulled all the power plays, and all the plagues, and who split the Red Sea, and who put a pillar of clouds up in the sky and now all of a sudden, they become my people. But Moses kept his cool, and he knew that the most important center of his attack would have to be on what he judged to be God's prime value. As Moses read it, it was that God wanted to be number one, all through the Old Testament one bumps into there shall be no other gods before me, thou shalt not worship false gods, I am a jealous and vindictive God, thou shalt not use the Lord's name in vain. And so it goes on and on, including the first part of the Ten Commandments. Knowing this Moses took off on his attack, he began arguing and telling God to cool it. At this point, trying to figure out Moses' motivations, one would wonder whether it was because he was loyal to his own people, or felt sorry for them, or whether he just didn't want the job of breeding a whole new people, because after all he was pushing 120 and that's asking a lot. At any rate, he began to negotiate, saying look, God you're God. You're holding all the cards. Whatever you want to do you can do, and nobody can stop you. But you know God, you just can't scratch that deal you've got with these people you remember, the covenant in which you promised them not communication, 91 only to take them out of slavery, but that they would practically inherit the earth. Yeah I know, you're going to tell me that they broke their end of it all, so all bets are off, but it isn't that easy. You're in a spot. The news of this deal has leaked out all over the joint. The Egyptians, Philistines, Canaanites, every Bodine is about it. But as I said before your God, go ahead and knock them off. What do you care if people are going to say, there goes God you can't believe anything, he tells you. You can't make a deal with him. His word isn't even worth the stone, it's written on. But after all your God, and I suppose you can handle it. And the Lord was appeased from doing the evil which he had spoken against his people. Another maxim in effective communication is that people have to make their own decisions. It isn't just that Moses couldn't tell God what God should do. No organizer can tell a community, either, what to do. Much of the time though, the organizer will have a pretty good idea of what the community should be doing, and he will want to suggest maneuver and persuade the community toward that action. He will not ever seem to tell the community what to do. Instead he will use loaded questions. For example, in a meeting on tactics, where the organizer is convinced that tactic Z is the thing to do. Organizer, what do you think we should do now? Community leader, no. One, I think we should do tactic X. Organizer, what do you think? Leader number two. Leader number two. Yeah, that sounds pretty good to me. Organizer, what about you number three? Rules for radicals 92. Leader number three. Well, I don't know. It sounds good, but something worries me. What do you think, organizer? Organizer, the important thing is what you guys think. 
What's the something that worries you? Leader number three. I don't know it's something organizer. I got a hunch that I don't know, but I remember yesterday you and no one talking and explaining to me something about somebody who once tried something like tactic X and it left him wide open because of this and that so it didn't work or something. Remember telling me about that no one leader number one who has been listening and now knows tactic X won't work. Sure. Sure. I remember. Yeah, well, we all know X won't work. Organizer. Yeah. We also know that unless we put out all the things that won't work, we'll never get to the one that will. Right. Leader no. One fervently. Absolutely. And so the guided questioning goes on without anyone losing face or being left out of the decision making. Every weakness of every proposed tactic is probed by questions. Eventually someone suggests tactic Z, and again through questions, its positive features emerge and it is decided on. Is this manipulation? Certainly just as a teacher manipulates, and no less, even a Socrates. As time goes on, and education proceeds, the leadership becomes increasingly sophisticated. The organizer recedes, from the local circle of decision makers. His response to questions about what Re thinks becomes a non-directive counter-question, what do you think? His job becomes one of weaning the group away from any dependency upon him. Then his job is done. Communication 93 While the organizer proceeds, on the basis of questions, the community leaders always regard his judgment above their own. They believe that he knows his job, he knows the right tactics, that's why he is their organizer. The organizer knows that even if they feel that way consciously, if he starts issuing orders and explaining it would begin to build up a subconscious resentment, a feeling that the organizer is putting them down is not respecting their dignity as individuals. The organizer knows that it is a human characteristic that someone who asks for help and gets it reacts not only with gratitude but with a subconscious hostility toward the one who helped him. It is a sort of psychic original sin, because he feels that the one who helped him is always aware that if it hadn't been for his help, he would still be a defeated nothing. All this involves a skillful and sensitive role playing on the part of the organizer. In the beginning the organizer is the general, he knows where, what and how, but he never wears his four stars, never is addressed as, nor acts as a general he is an organizer. There are times, too plenty, of them, when the organizer discovers, in the course of discussions, like the one above that tactic Z, or whatever it was he decided on ahead of time, is not the appropriate tactic. At this point, let's hope his ego is strong enough, to allow someone else to have the answer. One of the factors that changes, what you can and, can't communicate is relationships. There are sensitive areas that one does not touch until there is a strong personal relationship based on common involvements. Otherwise the other party turns off and literally does not hear, regardless of whether your words are within his experience. Rules for Radicals 94 Conversely if you have a good relationship, he is very receptive and your message comes through in a positive context. For example, I have always believed that birth control and abortion are personal rights to be exercised by the individual. If in my early days, when I organized the Back of the Yards neighborhood in Chicago, which was 95% Roman Catholic, I had tried to communicate this even through the experience of the residents, whose economic plight was aggravated by large families that would have been the end of my relationship with the community. That instant I would have been stamped as an enemy of the church, and all communication would have ceased. Some years later, after establishing solid relationships, I was free to talk about anything, including birth control. I remember discussing it with the then Catholic Chancellor. By then the argument was no longer limited to such questions as, how much longer do you think the Catholic Church can hang on to this archaic notion and still survive? I remember seeing five priests in the waiting room who wanted to see the chancellor and knowing his contempt for each one of them, I said look, I'll prove to you that you do really believe in birth control, even though you are making all kinds of noises against it, and then I opened the door, saying take a look out there. Can you look at them, and tell me you oppose birth control? He cracked up, and said that's an unfair argument, and you know it but the subject and nature of the discussion would have been unthinkable without that solid relationship. 
a classic example of the failure to communicate because the organizer has gone completely outside the experience of the people is the attempt by campus activists communication 95 to indicate to the poor the bankruptcy of their prevailing values. Take my word for it, if you get a good job and a split-level ranch house out in the suburbs, a color TV, two cars, and money in the bank, that just won't bring you happiness. The response without exception is always yay. Let me be the judge of that one I'll let you know after I get it. Communication on a general basis, without being fractured into the specifics of experience becomes rhetoric, and it carries a very limited meaning. It is the difference between being informed of the death of a quarter of a million people which becomes a statistic or the death of one or two close friends or loved ones or members of one's family. In the latter it becomes the full emotional impact of the finality of tragedy. In trying to explain what the personal relationship means, I have told various audiences, if the chairman of this meeting had opened up by saying, I am shocked and sorry to have to report to you that we have just been notified that Mr. Alinsky has just been killed in a plane crash, and therefore this lecture is cancelled the only reaction you would have would be, well gee, that's too bad. I wonder what he was like, but oh well, let's see, what are we going to do this evening? We've got the evening free now. We could go to a movie. And that is all that one would expect, except of those who have known me, in the past, regardless of what the relationship was. Now suppose after finishing this lecture, let us assume that all of you, have disagreed with everything I have said. You don't like my face, the sound of my voice, my manner, my clothes, you just don't like me period. Let us further assume that I am to lecture to you again next week and at that time you are informed of my sudden death. Your reaction will be very different regardless of your rules for radicals 96 dislike. You will react with shock. You will say why just yesterday he was alive breathing talking and laughing. It just seems incredible to believe that suddenly like that he's gone. This is the human reaction to a personal relationship. What is of particular importance here however is the fact that you were dealing with one specific person and not a general mass. It is what was implicit in the reputed statement of that organizational genius Samuel Adams at the time when he was allegedly planning the Boston Massacre. He was quoted as saying that there ought to be no less than three or four killed so that we will have martyrs for the revolution but... There must be no more than 10, because after you get beyond that number, we no longer have martyrs, but simply a sewage problem. This is the problem in trying to communicate on the issue of the H-bomb. It is too big. It involves too many casualties. It is beyond the experience of people, and they just react with yay. It is a terrible thing, but it really does not grip them. It is the same thing with figures. The moment one gets into the area of $25 million and above, let alone a billion, the listener is completely out of touch, no longer really interested, because the figures have gone above his experience, and almost are meaningless. Millions of Americans do not know how many million dollars make up a billion. This element of the specific that must be small enough to be grasped by the hands of experience ties very definitely into the whole scene of issues. Issues must be able to be communicated. It is essential that they can be communicated. It is essential that they be simple enough to be grasped as rallying or battle cries. They cannot be communication 97 generalities, like sin or immorality or the good life or morals. They must be this immorality of slash slash seven slash slim landlord with slash slash seven slash slim tenement where these people suffer. It should be obvious by now that communication occurs concretely by means of one's specific experience. General theories become meaningful only when one has absorbed and understood the specific constituents and then related them back to a general concept. Unless this is done, the specifics become nothing more than a string of interesting anecdotes. That is the world as it is in communication. In the beginning in the beginning, the incoming organizer must establish his identity, or putting it another way, get his license to operate. He must have a reason for being there, a reason acceptable to the people. Any stranger is suspect. Who's the cat? What's he asking all those questions for? Is he really the cops or the FBI? What's his bag? What's he really after? What's in it for him? Who's he working for? 
The answers to these questions must be acceptable, in terms of the experience of the community. If the organizer begins with an affirmation, of his love for people, he promptly turns everyone off. If on the other hand, he begins with a denunciation of exploiting employers, slum landlords, police shakedowns, gouging merchants, he is inside their experience, and they accept him. People can make judgments only on the basis of their own experiences. And the question in their minds is, if we were in the organizer's position, would we do what he is doing, and if so, why? Until they have an answer, that is at least somewhat acceptable they find it difficult to understand and accept the organizer. In the beginning 99, his acceptance as an organizer depends on his success in convincing key people and many others first that he is on their side, and second, that he has ideas and knows how to fight to change things that he's not one of. These guys doing his thing, that he's a winner. Otherwise who needs him? All his presence means, is that the census changes, from 225,000, to 225,001. It is not enough to persuade them of, your competence, talents, and courage. They must have faith, in your ability, and courage. They must believe in your capacity, not just to provide the opportunity, for action, power, change, adventure, a piece of the drama of life, but to give a very definite promise, almost an assurance of victory. They must also have faith in your courage to fight the oppressive establishment courage that they, too will begin to get once they have the protective armor of a power organization, but don't have during the first lonely steps forward. Love and faith are not common companions. More commonly power and fear consort with faith. The have-nots have a limited faith in the worth of their own judgments. They still look to the judgments of the haves. They respect the strength of the upper class and they believe that the haves are more intelligent, more competent and endowed with something special. Distance has a way of enhancing power so that respect becomes tinged with reverence. The haves are the authorities and thus the beneficiaries of the various myths and legends that always develop around power. The have-nots will believe them where they would be hesitant and uncertain about their own judgments. Power is not to be crossed. One must respect and obey. Power means strength, whereas love is a human frailty, the people mistrust. It is a sad fact of life that power and fear are the fountainheads of faith. Rules for Radicals 100 The job of the organizer is to maneuver and bait the establishment so that it will publicly attack him as a dangerous enemy. The word enemy is sufficient to put the organizer on the side of the people to identify him with the have-nots, but it is not enough to endow him with the special qualities that induce fear and thus give him the means to establish his own power against the establishment. Here again we find that it is power and fear that are essential to the development of faith. This need is met by the establishment's use of the brand dangerous, for in that one word the establishment reveals its fear of the organizer, its fear that he represents a threat to its omnipotence. Now the organizer has his birth certificate and can begin. In 1939, when I first began to organize back of the old Chicago stockyards, on the site of Upton Sinclair's jungle, I acted in such a way, that within a few weeks the meat packers publicly pronounced me, a subversive menace, the Chicago Tribune's adoption, of me as a public, enemy of law and order, a radical's radical, gave me a perennial and constantly renewable baptismal certificate in the city of Chicago. A generation later, in a black community, on Chicago's south side, next to my alma mater, the University of Chicago, it was the university's virulent personal attack on me, augmented by attacks by the press that strengthened my credentials with a black community, somewhat suspicious of white skin. Eastman Kodak and the Gannett newspaper chain did the same for me, in Rochester, New York. In both black ghettos, in Chicago and in Rochester, the reaction was... The way the fat cat white newspapers are ripping hell out of Alinsky he must be all right. I could very easily have gone into either Houston, Texas or Oakland, California. In the former, the in the beginning 101. Ku Klux Klan appeared at the airport in full regalia with threats against my personal security. The Houston press printed charges against me by the mayor of Houston and there was a mass picket line by the John Birch Society. In Oakland, the city council, fearing the possibility of my coming into Oakland, passed a widely publicized special resolution, declaring me unwelcome in the city. 
In both cases, the black communities were treated to the spectacle of seeing the establishment react with unusually severe fear and hysteria. Establishing one's credentials of competency is only part of the organizer's first job. He needs other credentials to begin credentials that enable him to meet the question, who asked you to come in here? With the answer, you did. He must be invited by a significant sector of the local population their churches, street organizations, social clubs, or other groups. Today my notoriety and the hysterical instant reaction of the establishment not only validate my credentials of competency, but also ensure automatic popular invitation. An example was the invitation into the black ghettos in Rochester. In 1964 Rochester exploded in a bloody race riot resulting in the calling of the National Guard, the fatal crash of a police helicopter, and considerable loss of life and property. In its wake, the city was numb with shock. A city proud of its affluence, culture, and progressive churches, was dazed and guilt-ridden, at its rude discovery of the misery of life in the ghetto and of its failure to do anything about it. The City Council of Churches, representing the Protestant churches, approached me and asked me if I would be available to help organize the Black Ghetto to get equality, jobs housing, quality education, rules for Radicals 102 and particularly power to participate in the decision-making in all public programs involving their people. They also demanded that the representatives of the black community be those chosen by the blacks and not those selected by the white establishment. I advised the church council of the cost and said that my organization was available. The council agreed to the cost and invited us to come in and organize. I replied then that the churches had a right to invite us in to organize their people in slash carrot slash slash neighborhoods but that they had no right to speak for let alone invite anyone into the black community. I emphasized that we were not a colonial power, like the churches who sent their missionaries, everywhere whether they were invited or not. The black community had been silent, but at that point panic gripped the white establishment. The Rochester Press, in front page stories and editorials, raised the cry that if I came to Rochester it would mean the end of good fellowship, of brotherhood week, of Christian understanding, between black and white, yet meant that I would say to the blacks, the only way you can get your legitimate rights is to organize, get the power, and tell the white establishment either come around, or else, the blacks read and heard, and agreed. Between the press and the mass media, you would have assumed that my coming to Rochester was equivalent to the city's being invaded by the Russians, the Chinese, and the bubonic plague. Rochesterians will never forget it, and one had to be there to believe it. And so we were invited, in by nearly every church and organization in the ghetto, and by petitions signed by thousands of ghetto residents. Now we had a legitimate right to be there, even more of a right than any of the inviting organizations in the ghetto, for in the beginning 103, even they had not been invited, in by the mass of their community. This advantage is the dividend of reputation, but the important issue here is how the organizer, without a reputation gets the invitation. The organizer's job is to inseminate an invitation for himself to agitate, introduce ideas, get people pregnant with hope and a desire for change, and to identify you as the person most qualified for this purpose. Here the tool of the organizer in the agitation leading to the invitation, as well as actual organization and education of local leadership, is the use of the question, the Socratic method. Organizer, do you live over in that shimmy building? Answer. Yeah, what about it, organizer? What the hell do you live there for? Answer, what do you mean, what do I live there for? Where else am I going to live? I'm on welfare, organizer. Oh, you mean you pay rent in that place? Answer, come on, is this a put on? Very funny. You know where you can live for free, organizer. HMM. That place looks like it's crawling with rats and bugs. Answer, it sure is, organizer. Did you ever try to get that landlord to do anything about it? Answer. Try to get him to do anything about anything. If you don't like it, get out. That's all he has to say. There are plenty more waiting. Organizer. What if you didn't pay your rent? Answer. They'd throw us out in 10 minutes. Organizer. HMM. What if nobody in that building paid their rent? Rules for Radicals 104 Answer. Well they'd start to throw, hey you know, they'd have trouble throwing everybody out, wouldn't they? 
Answer. Hey, you know, maybe you got something say. I'd like you to meet some of my friends. How about a drink? Policy after power one of the great problems in the beginning of an organization is often that the people do not know what they want. Discovering this stirs up in the organizer that inner doubt shared by so many whether the masses of people are competent to make decisions for a democratic society. It is the schizophrenia of a free society that we outwardly espouse faith in the people but inwardly have strong doubts whether the people can be trusted. These reservations can destroy the effectiveness of the most creative and talented organizer. Many times, contact with low-income groups does not fire one with enthusiasm for the political gospel of democracy. This disillusionment comes partly because we romanticize the poor in a way we romanticize other sectors of society, and partly because when you talk with any people, you find yourselves confronted with cliches, a variety of superficial, stereotyped responses, and a general lack of information. In a black ghetto, if you ask, what's wrong? You are told well, the schools are segregated. What do you think should be done to make in the beginning, 105 better schools? Well, they should be desegregated. How? Well you know. And if you say you don't know, then a lack of knowledge or an inability on the part of the one you are talking to may show itself in a defensive, hostile reaction. You whites were responsible for the segregation in the first place. We didn't do it. So it's your problem, not ours. You started it, you finish it. If you pursue the point by asking, well what else is wrong with the schools right now? You get the answer, the buildings are old. The teachers are bad. We've got to have change. Well. What kind of change? Well everybody knows things have to be changed. That is usually the end of the line. If you push it any further, you come again to a hostile, defensive reaction or to withdrawal, as they suddenly remember they have to be somewhere else. The issue that is not clear to organizers, missionaries, educators, or any outsider, is simply that if people feel they don't have the power to change a bad situation, then they do not think about it. Why start figuring out how you are going to spend a million dollars if you do not have a million dollars or are ever going to have a million dollars unless you want to engage in fantasy? Once people are organized so that they have the power to make changes, then, when confronted with questions of change, they begin to think and to ask questions about how to make the changes. If the teachers in the schools are bad then, what do we mean by a bad teacher? What is a good teacher? How do we get good teachers? When we say our children do not understand what the teachers are talking about and our teachers do not understand what the children are talking about, then we ask how communication can be established. Why cannot teach rules for radicals 206ers communicate with the children and the latter with the teachers? What are the hang-ups? Why don't the teachers understand what the values are in our neighborhood? How can we make them understand? All these and many other perceptive questions begin to arise. It is when people have a genuine opportunity to act and to change conditions that they begin to think their problems through then, they show their competence, raise the right questions, seek special professional counsel, and look for the answers. Then you begin to realize that believing in people is not just a romantic myth, but here you see that the first requirement for communication and education is for people to have a reason for knowing. It is the creation of the instrument or the circumstances of power that provides the reason and makes knowledge essential. Remember too, that a powerless people will not be purposefully curious about life and that they then cease being alive. Something else that comes with experience is the knowledge that the resolution of a particular problem will bring on another problem. The organizer may know this, but he doesn't mention it. If he did he would invite and encounter a feeling of futility on the part of the others. Why bother doing this if it means another problem? We fight and win, and what have we won? So let's forget it. He knows too that what we fight for now as matters of life and death will be soon forgotten, and changed situations will change desires and issues. It is common for policy to be the product of power. You begin to build power for a particular program, then the program changes when some power has been built. The reaction of the Woodlawn leaders was typical on this point. 
In the beginning 107, in the beginning of the organization of the Black Ghetto of Woodlawn, there were five major issues, involving urban renewal, all centering on stopping the close-by University of Chicago from bulldozing the ghetto. The Woodlawn organization quickly developed power and scored a series of victories. Eight months later the city of Chicago issued a new policy statement on urban renewal. That day the leaders of the Woodlawn organization stormed into my office, angrily denouncing the policy statement. The city can't get away with this, who do they think they are? Well put barricades, in our streets, well fight. Throughout the tirade it never occurred to any of the angry leaders that the city's new policy granted all the five demands for which the Woodlawn organization began. Then they were fighting for hamburger. Now they wanted filet mignon. So it goes, and why not? An organizer knows that life is a sea of shifting desires, changing elements of relativity and uncertainty, and yet he must stay within the experience of the people he is working with and act in terms of specific resolutions and answers of definitiveness and certainty. To do otherwise would be to stifle organization and action for what the organizer accepts as uncertainty would be seen by them as a terrifying chaos. In the early days, the organizer moves out front in any situation of risk where the power of the establishment can get someone's job, call in an overdue payment or any other form of retaliation, partly because these dangers would cause many local people to back off from conflict. Here the organizer serves as a protective shield. If anything goes wrong it is all his fault, he has the responsibility. If they are successful all credit goes to the local people. Rules for Radicals 108 He acts as the septic tank, in the early stages he gets all the sheep. Later as power increases, the risks diminish, and gradually the people step out front to take the risks. This is part of the process of growing up, both for the local community leaders, and for the organization. The organizer must know and be sensitive to the shadows that surround him during his first days in the community. One of the shadows is that it is just about impossible for people to fully understand, much less adhere to, a totally new idea. The fear of change is, as discussed earlier, one of our deepest fears, and a new idea must be at the least couched in the language of past ideas. Often it must be, at first, diluted with vestiges of the past. Rationalization A large shadow over organizing efforts in the beginning is then rationalization. Everyone has a reason or rationalization for what he does or does not do. No matter what, every action carries its rationalization. One of Chicago's political ward bosses, nationally notorious for his use of the chain ballot and multiple voting once unleashed a tirade, well seasoned with alcohol, on my being a disloyal American. He climaxed with, and you Alinsky. When that great day of America, election day, comes around, that day of the right to vote for, which our ancestors fought and died, when that great day, comes around you care so little, for your country that you never even, bother to vote more than once. In the beginning 109 organizing, one must be aware of the tremendous importance of understanding the part played by rationalization, on a mass basis it is similar to the function on an individual basis. On a mass basis, it is the community residents and leadership's justification for why they have not been able to do anything until the organizer appeared. It is primarily a subconscious feeling that the organizer is looking down on them, wondering why they did not have the intelligence, so to speak, and the insights to realize that through organization and the securing of power, they could have resolved many of the problems they've lived with for these many years. Why did they have to wait for him? With this going on in their minds, they throw up a whole series of arguments against various organizational procedures, but they are not real arguments, simply attempts to justify the fact that they have not moved or organized in the past. Most people find this necessary, not only to justify themselves to the organizer, but also to themselves. In an individual a psychiatrist would call these rationalizations, as we call them here, defenses. The patient has a series of defenses, which in therapy have to be broken through, to get to the problem, which the patient then is compelled to confront. Chasing rationalizations is like attempting to find the rainbow. Rationalizations must be recognized as such so that the organizer does not get trapped in communication problems or in treating them as the real situations. 
an extreme example, but one that very clearly spelled out the nature of rationalizations, came about three years ago when I met with various Canadian Indian leaders in the north of a Canadian province. I was there at the Rules for Radicals 110 invitation of these leaders who wanted to discuss their problems and solicit my advice. The problems of the Canadian Indians are very similar to those of the American Indians. They are on reservations, they are segregated, relatively speaking, and they suffer from all the general discriminatory practices Indians have been subjected to since the white man took over North America. In Canada the census figures on the Indian population range from 150,000 to 225,000 out of a total population estimated at between 22 and 24 million. The conversation began with my suggesting that the general approach should be that the Indians get together, crossing all tribal lines, and organize. Because of their relatively small numbers I thought that they should then work with various sectors of the white liberal population, gain them as allies, and then begin to move nationally. Immediately I ran into the rationalizations. The dialogue went something like this I should preface this by noting that it was quite obvious what was happening since I could see from the way the Indians were looking at each other they were thinking. So we invite this white organizer from south of the border to come up here and he tells us to get organized and to do these things. What must be going through his mind is, what's wrong with you Indians that you have been sitting around here for a couple of hundred years now and you haven't organized to do these things. And so it began. Indians. Well we can't organize. Me. Why not? Indians. Because that's a white man's way of doing things. Me I decided to let that one pass though it obviously wasn't true since mankind from time immemorial has always organized regardless of what race or color they in the beginning 111 were whenever they wanted to bring about change. I don't understand. Indians. Well you see if we organize that means getting out and fighting the way you are telling us to do and that would mean that we would be corrupted by the white man's culture and lose our own values. Me. What are these values that you would lose, Indians? Well, there are all kinds of values. Me. Like what, Indians? Well, there's creative fishing. Me. What do you mean, creative fishing, Indians? Creative fishing. Me. I heard you the first time. What is this creative fishing, Indians? Well, you see, when you whites go out and fish, you just go out and fish, don't you? Me. Yeah, I guess so, Indians. Well you see, when we go out and fish, we fish creatively. Me. Yeah. That's the third time you've come around with that. What is this creative fishing? Indians. Well, to begin with when we go out fishing, we get away from everything. We get way out in the woods. Me. Well we whites don't exactly go fishing in Times Square, you know. Indians. Yes but it's different with us. When we go out, we're out on the water, and you can hear the lap of the waves on the bottom of the canoe, and the birds in the trees, and the leaves rustling, and you know what I mean. Me. No, I don't know what you mean. Furthermore, I think that that's just a pile of sheet. Do you believe it yourself? This brought a shocked silence. It should be noted that I was not being profane purely for the sake of being rules for radical slash 12 profane. I was doing this purposefully. If I had responded in a tactful way, saying well, I don't quite understand what you mean, we would have been off for a ride around the rhetorical ranch for the next 30 days. Here profanity became literally an up against the wall bulldozer. From there we went off to creative welfare. Creative welfare seemed to have to do with since whites stole Indians lands, all Indians welfare payments are really installment payments due to them, and it's not really welfare or charity. Well that took us another 5 or 10 minutes and we kept breaking through one creative rationalization after another until finally we got down to the issue of organization. An interesting aftermath is that some of this was filmed by the National Film Board of Canada which was doing a series of documentaries on my work and a film with part of this episode was shown at a meeting of Canadian development workers with a number of these Indians present. The white Canadian community development workers kept looking at the floor, very embarrassed during the unreeling of that scene, and giving sidelong looks at the Indians. 
After it was over one of the Indians stood up and said when Mr. Alinsky told us we were full of sheet that was the first time a white man has really talked to us as equals you would never say that to us. You would always say well I can see your point of view but I'm a little confused and stuff like that. In other words you treat us as children. Learn to search out the rationalizations, treat them as rationalizations and break through. Do not make the mistake of locking yourself up in conflict with them as though they were the issues or problems with which you are trying to engage the local people. In the beginning 113, the process of power from the moment the organizer enters a community he lives, dreams, eats, breathes, sleeps only one thing and that is to build the mass power base of what he calls the army. Until he has developed that mass power base, he confronts no major issues. He has nothing with which to confront anything. Until he has those means and power instruments, his tactics are very different from power tactics. Therefore, every move revolves around one central point. How many recruits will this bring into the organization, whether by means of local organizations, churches, service groups, labor unions, corner gangs, or as individuals? The only issue is, how will this increase the strength of the organization? If by losing in a certain action, he can get more members than by winning, then victory lies in losing, and he will lose. Change comes from power, and power comes from organization. In order to act, people must get together. Power is the reason for being of organizations. When people agree on certain religious ideas, and want the power to propagate their faith, they organize and call it a church. When people agree on certain political ideas and want the power to put them into practice, they organize and call it a political party. The same reason holds across the board. Power and organization are one and the same. The organizer knows, for example, that his biggest job is to give the people the feeling that they can do something, that while they may accept the idea that organization means power, they have to experience this idea in rules for radical slash 14. Action. The organizer's job is to begin to build confidence and hope in the idea of organization and thus in the people themselves to win limited victories, each of which will build confidence and the feeling that if we can do so much with what we have now just think what we will be able to do when we get big and strong. It is almost like taking a prize fighter up the road to the championship you have to very carefully and selectively pick his opponents, knowing full well that certain defeats would be demoralizing and end his career. Sometimes the organizer may find such despair among the people that he has to put on a cinch fight. An example occurred in the early days of Back of the Yards, the first community that I attempted to organize. This neighborhood was utterly demoralized. The people had no confidence in themselves, or in their neighbors, or in their cause, so we staged a cinch fight. One of the major problems, in back of the yards, in those days was an extraordinarily high rate of infant mortality. Some years earlier, the neighborhood had had the services of the Infant Welfare Society medical clinics. But about 10 or 15 years before I came to the neighborhood, the Infant Welfare Society had been expelled because tales were spread that its personnel was disseminating birth control information. The churches therefore drove out these agents of sin. But soon the people were desperately in need of infant medical services. They had forgotten that they themselves had expelled the Infant Welfare Society from the back of the yards community. After checking it out, I found out that all we had to do to get Infant Welfare Society medical services back into the neighborhood was ask for it. However, I kept this information to myself. We called an emergency meeting in the beginning 115, recommended we go in committee to the society's offices and demand medical services. Our strategy was to prevent the officials from saying anything to start banging on the desk and demanding that we get the services, slash 7A slash E, slash permitting them to interrupt us or make any statement. The only time we would let them talk was after we got through. With this careful indoctrination, we stormed into the Infant Welfare Society downtown, identified ourselves, and began a tirade consisting of militant demands, refusing to permit them to say anything. All the time the poor woman was desperately trying to say why, of course you can have it, well start immediately. But she never had a chance to say anything, and finally we ended up in a storm of and we will not take no for an answer. 
At which point she said well, I've been trying to tell you. And I cut in, demanding is it yes, or is it no? She said well of course, it's yes. I said that's all, we wanted to know. And we stormed out of the place. All the way back to back of the yards, you could hear the members of the committee, saying well, that's the way, to get things done. You just tell them off, and don't give them a chance, to say anything. If we could get this, with just the few people, that we have in the organization now, just imagine what we can get, when we have a big organization. I suggest that before critics, look upon this as trickery they reflect on the discussion of means, and ends. The organizer simultaneously carries, on many functions as he analyzes attacks, and disrupts the prevailing power pattern. The ghetto or slum, in which he is organizing is not a disorganized community. There is no such animal, as a disorganized community. It is a contradiction in terms, to use the two words disorganization, and community, together. The word community itself means and rules, for radicals 116 organized, communal life, people living in an organized fashion. The people in the community may have experienced successive frustrations, to the point that their will to participate has seemed to atrophy. They may be living in anonymity, and may be starved for personal recognition. They may be suffering from various forms of deprivation and discrimination. They may have accepted anonymity, and resigned in apathy. They may despair that their children will inherit a somewhat better world. From your point of view, they may have a very negative form of existence, but the fact is that they are organized, in that way of life. Call it organized apathy, or organized non-participation, but that is their community pattern. They are living under a certain set of arrangements, standards, way of life. They may in short, have surrendered, but life goes on in an organized form, with a definite power structure. Even if it is, as Thoreau called most lives, quiet desperation. Therefore if your function is to attack apathy, and get people to participate it is necessary, to attack the prevailing patterns of organized living in the community. The first step in community organization, is community disorganization. The disruption of the present organization, is the first step, toward community organization. Present arrangements must be disorganized, if they are to be displaced by new patterns that provide the opportunities and means for citizen participation. All change means disorganization of the old and organization of the new. This is why the organizer is immediately confronted with conflict. The organizer dedicated to changing the life of a particular community must first rub raw the resentments of the people of the community. Fan the latent hostilities of many of the people to the point of overt expression. He must search out controversy and issues rather in the beginning, 117 than avoid them, for unless there is controversy people are not concerned enough to act. The use of the adjective controversial to qualify the word issue is a meaningless redundancy. There can be no such thing as a non-controversial issue. When there is agreement, there is no issue. Issues only arise when there is disagreement, or controversy. An organizer must stir up dissatisfaction and discontent. Provide a channel into which the people, can angrily pour their frustrations. He must create a mechanism, that can drain off the underlying guilt, for having accepted the previous situation, for so long a time. Out of this mechanism, a new community organization arises. But more on this point later. The job then is getting the people, to move, to act, to participate, in short to develop and harness the necessary power to effectively conflict with the prevailing patterns, and change them. When those prominent in the status quo, turn and label you an agitator, they are completely correct, for that is, in one word, your function, to agitate to the point of conflict. A sound analogy is to be found, in the organization of trade unions. A competent union organizer approaches his objective, let's say the organization of a particular industrial plant, where the workers are underpaid, suffering from discriminatory practices, and without job security. The workers accept these conditions as inevitable, and they express their demoralization by saying, what's the use? In private they resent these circumstances, complain talk about the futility of booking the big shots, and generally succumb to frustration, all because of the lack of opportunity for effective action. Enter the labor organizer, or the agitator. 
he begins his troublemaking by stirring up these angers, frustra rules for radicals slash attentions and resentments and highlighting specific issues or grievances that heighten controversy. He dramatizes the injustices by describing conditions at other industrial plants engaged in the same kind of work where the workers are far better off economically and have better working conditions, job security, health benefits, and pensions as well as other advantages that had not even been thought of by the workers he is trying to organize. Just as important, he points out that the workers, in the other places, had also been exploited in the past and had existed under similar circumstances, until they used their intelligence and energies to organize into a power instrument known as a trade union, with the result that they achieved all of these other benefits. Generally this approach results in the formation of a new trade union. Let us examine what this labor organizer has done. He has taken a group of apathetic workers. He has fanned their resentments and hostilities by a number of means, including challenging contrasts of better conditions of other workers in similar industries. Most important, he has demonstrated that something can be done and that there is a concrete way of doing it that has already proven its effectiveness and success. That by organizing together as a trade union they will have the power and the instrument with which to make these changes. He now has the workers, participating in a trade union, and supporting its program. We must never forget that so long, as there is no opportunity or method to make changes, it is senseless to get people agitated or angry, leaving them no course of action, except to blow their tops. And so the labor organizer simultaneously breeds conflict and builds a power structure. The war between the trade union and management is resolved either through in the beginning 119 strike or a negotiation. Either method involves the use of power, the economic power of the strike or the threat of it which results in successful negotiations. No one can negotiate without the power to compel negotiation. This is the function of a community organizer. Anything otherwise is wishful non-thinking. To attempt to operate on a goodwill, rather than on a power basis, would be to attempt something that the world has not yet experienced. In the beginning the organizer's first job is to create the issues or problems. It sounds mad to say that a community such as a low-income ghetto or even a middle-class community has no issues per Southeast. The reader may feel that this statement borders on lunacy, particularly with reference to low-income communities. The simple fact is that in any community, regardless of how poor, people may have serious problems but they do not have issues, they have a bad scene. An issue is something you can do something about, but as long as you feel powerless and unable to do anything about it, all you have is a bad scene. The people resign themselves to a rationalization. It's that kind of world, it's a crumby world, we didn't ask to come into it, but we are stuck with it, and all we can do is hope that something happens somewhere, somehow, sometime. This is what is usually taken as apathy, what we discussed earlier, that policy follows power. Through action, persuasion, and communication the organizer makes it clear that organization will give them the power, the ability, the strength, the force to be able to do something about these particular problems. It is then that a bad scene begins to break up into specific issues because now the people can do something about it. What the organizer does is convert the plight into a problem. The question is rules for radicals 120, whether they do it this way or that way or whether they do all of it or part of it. But now you have issues. The organization is born out of the issues and the issues are bomb out of the organization. They go together. They are concomitants essential to each other. Organizations are built on issues that are specific, immediate, and realizable. Organizations must be based on many issues. Organizations need action as an individual needs oxygen. The cessation of action brings death to the organization through factionalism and inaction, through dialogues and conferences that are actually a form of rigor mortis rather than life. It is impossible to maintain constant action on a single issue. A single issue is a fatal straitjacket that will stifle the life of an organization. Furthermore, a single issue drastically limits your appeal, where multiple issues would draw in the many potential members, essential to the building of a broad, mass-based organization. Each person has a hierarchy of desires or values. 
He may be sympathetic to your single issue, but not concerned enough about that particular one, to work and fight for it. Many issues mean many members. Communities are not economic organizations, like labor unions, with specific economic issues. They are as complex as life itself. To organize a community you must understand that in a highly mobile urbanized society, the word community means community of interests, not physical community. The exceptions are ethnic ghettos, where segregation has resulted in physical communities that coincide with their community of interests, or during political campaigns, political districts that are based on geographical demarcations. People hunger for drama and adventure, for a breath in the beginning, 121 of life, in a dreary, drab existence. One of a number of cartoons, in my office shows, two gum-chewing stenographers, who have just left the movie.